I am so pleased to welcome the Diary of a Dad, AKA Ben Anderson. Nothing really can prepare you for a child entering the world. When that child arrives, you gotta figure it all out. <laughs> my, my children are mixed race, so even within that, there's an element of privilege, if, if you like. I don't wanna get it into their heads, certainly at this age, that they're going to have to try harder because of the color of their skin. Three back-to-back, -back, barely normal pregnancies and, and healthy children, and then just this shock. You could just tell by their faces that something wasn't right guy that I've known in the music industry for some time he sits me down and he's just like I just wanted to say that you know I love watching what you guys have done over the last you know however many years it's really inspiring and I broke down and started crying Hello and welcome to the Dad Vengers podcast sponsored by Tonka because being tough is all about getting out and playing my name's Nigel Clark and I'm founder of Dead Vengers and host of this wonderful parenting podcast where we explore different aspects of parenting and hone in on the dad point of view. But it's not just about the dads. Mums, grandparents, carers, soon to be parents, we want you involved in the conversation too. So wherever you're listening to this podcast, please, please, please subscribe. It's so important because we can only continue to have important conversations like this if we can prove you're out there listening and subscribing is the best way to let us know. So let's talk, let's laugh, let's share the things we find difficult and become the type of dads we really wanna be. Before we start, I'd like to warn listeners that during this episode, we will be talking about topics that some listeners may find triggering namely premature birth and baby loss. So please look after your well-being and take care of yourself. Today's guest is a big name in the fatherhood community. Uh, he's the proud father of five children, which we know is a task in itself, uh, and he documents their daily lives on his Instagram. Um, for the most part, people would think that is enough, but today's guest also runs a successful business with his wife, Sophie, and earlier this year, he also launched a podcast. I am so pleased to welcome the Diary of a Dad, aka Ben Anderson. Hello, hello, how are you? Dude, I am happy to have you here. That was quite an intro. <laughs> well, we've we got to big up our guests here at Dad Vengers. We've got to big them up. There's a reason they're here. We, we've, we've watched, studied, and seeing what they've been up to. And, and we want to talk to them about it because we're proud of what they're doing. Amazing. Well, no, really happy to be here. And thank you for, for asking me to come on. No probs, no probs. So how you been? What's, what's the week been like? What's the month been like? You've been a busy man. What have you been up to? Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned it in the, in, uh, in the intro there. Um, obviously, we work in the music industry, specifically in concerts and live events. Mm -hmm. So... Coming out of the back of lockdown, um, which was a very quiet 18 months to two years for our business. <laughs> yeah, wow, well, yeah. Um, chilling and, and, and pulling out what, what little hair I had left because of uh, not really knowing what was going to go on in the, in the world of events and, you know, if we'd even sort of make it through that whole period. Um, yeah. But it's gone the complete opposite way now. Obviously, the, the appetite's there for people to, to be out and about, to be enjoying. Um, so, yeah, really, really busy on the, the planning side of things. Um, lots of things that we've got in the pipeline for, you know, the next couple of months, uh, even into next year. Um, we're also doing some stuff overseas as well um, and in some new territories. So, yeah, it's just it, it's pretty full on the days. Are, the days are jam packed. Um, you know, as you mentioned, having five kids, it's busy at the best of times anyway. <laughs> um, I get these moments of calm. Usually like we're recording, you know, in the morning now when the kids are when the older three are at school and the other two are downstairs. So. These are the moments of calm that I think I live for. Um, just, just to yeah. be able, just to be able to sit and sit, sit down, and no one bug me and for have a chat and have a no chat. Kids about exactly. <laughs> so you mentioned there that um, uh, lockdown was a bit of a quiet period for you. Was that worrying as a father um, of 
like it would have been four kids at the time, wouldn't it? It, it would have actually been three when we first went into mm. lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> There's a weird technicality here. <laughs> so Otis was Otis was born in August 2020. So obviously we went into lockdown in sort of like March. Right. Okay. Um, and yeah, and then, and then Zaya was born January 2022. We were basically out of it by then, I guess. Um, yeah. But still, you know, the odd restriction in in here and there. It was it was concerning. Um, I think, especially when your industry is based on 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 people being able to see people and be in a room with people, or in a stadium with people, or in an arena with people. Exactly. You know. And do you know what it was? It was initially. I found it quite refreshing because for the first time things had just slowed right down. And I also felt that for the first time, the whole of the industry was on a level playing field. It wasn't as though, Oh, if you were a big corporation, you could still do your events, but the independents couldn't, nobody could do anything. And so that sort of initial, we call it lockdown one now, you know, that sort of first initial period, I'd say between the March and maybe the summer before any of the restrictions started to be eased was actually quite refreshing. You know, it was, it was a nice downtime. Um, I remember going into lockdown and seeing, actually we had amazing weather for that first lockdown period um, the, over the Easter holidays. So it was kind of, it felt like the Easter holidays just ran into, you know, and it, it was an extended Easter break, I think is, is kind of the way that we were looking at it. Um, and it was new, it was exciting. You know, the kids, we, we're fortunate that at home we've got like the nice garden and, you know, just the space. So we never really sort of felt like we were on top of each other. Um, mm. And it was just, it was just, it was quite refreshing. And then I think it got to the point where, once people got into the routine of kind of working from home and that being a little bit more normal, I think that's kind of then when the expectation came, even within our industry, whilst we were still technically closed, it's like everybody still wanted you to kind of logistically sort things out and do things. And that's when it became a challenge because then suddenly we're now back to work, but at home with multiple children and different circumstances and, and all that. So I look back on the last couple of years with an element of fondness you know that first period <laughs> that, that first period when Sophie was pregnant with Otis you know it was that that was kind of almost like a bit of a dream because you go you wouldn't have got to do that if if you hadn't had a lockdown exactly right? yeah she she wouldn't have had to you know got that ch chance to stay in and you know just just take things very easily um and you know, even once things were back up and, and running to a degree, I guess there was still, you know, there wasn't that pressure then to have like everybody come round to the house to come and see a new baby and do all of that stuff. Because we were all still a little bit wary about whether, you know, you should be kind of doing that. So it was quite relaxing. So I look back on on those elements with, with fondness. Um, but yeah, I could have done without the stress, I guess, from a business side. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Now, you just mentioned that, um, you know, Lockdown was difficult for you with having so many kids. Mm -hmm. Did you always plan to have a big family? Absolutely not. Um, and that surprises a lot of people. I would say. Yeah, that surprises me because <laughs> you get to five children, you think, right, okay, you've always been the person who maybe grew up in a big family or you've always wanted a big family. So you're going for it. And it was the plan for you and your partner from the start. No, um, I, I grew up with two sisters. So, you know, three kids in, in, the, in the household. So nothing majorly big there and not really even surrounded by many families that were large. So there was there was definitely no sort of blueprint or, you know, model of a large family that I looked at and thought, you know, that's that's what I want to have. And I guess even when Sophie and I first got together, I often think about this and I, I talk to other dads about this and sort of ask them, you know, you know, did you guys have those open conversations, which was like, oh, we're going to have, you know, how many kids do you want? And I yeah. don't ever remember us actually sitting down and having that conversation. Um, I remember us both being open to the idea of children, but for us at the time when we got together, we got together, we started the business. And so that was kind of the priority. Um, and I always say to people that, we um we got dogs at the very start of once we got married in the August we we got dogs in the September 
And that was me kind of agreeing to have something this in is the a house test. that was This is a test. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a test. We'll get a dog. Well, then maybe we can talk about kids in a couple it's, of years. And that's literally what it was. It was like, let's have, <laughs> let's get the dogs. And then, you know, we'll see what happens within, within the next few years, because that's the trajectory that we were on. Um, and then we fell pregnant with Arlo in the November. So <laughs> surprise babies. I know all about that. My yeah. first Rory is a surprise baby as well. <laughs> So it throws your life into a, into a different space. Yeah. How was the adaption for you? Because you, you've said you, you weren't planning for that. You, you were planning for a dog. Come on, now we were going to take the little dog to the park, do the walk thing. Now you've got a human being. Yeah, exactly. And, I, and we chose two hours specifically so that we wouldn't have to do all of that like strenuous, you know, like three hour walks that I see people having to do with their larger dogs. Um, so yeah, we, we were kind of going for the easy option with those. I mean, it was a big change, don't get me wrong. I, th- I suppose we've been fortunate that even back then, so Arlo's going to be eight at the end of July. So even back then we were working, you know, we we were starting this business and growing this business. So we were essentially self-employed and, you know, it meant that there was an element of flexibility when it came to our schedule, but yeah, you know, nothing really can prepare you for a child entering the world. You can do all of the prenatal classes you can do all of the google searching that that i did but the reality is when that child arrives you got to figure it all out (laughs) can you remember any instances when you were like well what do i do or am i doing this right was there a nappy change situation was there uh i've been left with my child on on my own i remember even in the hospital when he was born and they obviously give you the option to you know change that the the nappy and or put, put it back put, put a nappy on <laughs> in the first place is kind of like the thing so i think they you i think they put a nappy on then it was like he'd go off and do some weighing it was, it was done in a weird order it was all very yeah. it was a very chaotic first but so it was kind of like this point where he didn't have a nappy on then he did then it needed to be taken off then put back on and i was kind of just standing there literally going oh that's the one thing that I never even thought about, which is bizarre now because I dread to think how many nappies I've changed over the last <laughs> eight years. Um, but just in that moment, suddenly think that's when it, I think the realization hit that I, I'd prepared for what you know taking him home was going to be like, and you know we planned the car seat and you know how that whole thing was going to work and the push chair and all of all of that stuff. But just that act of changing. The nappy or getting him getting him back into a nappy for the first time i hadn't practiced it on a doll or anything <laughs> see now you see do you think that's something that uh an expectant father should be doing i think they know yeah i think i take that as a little tip you know just, I'm, just... I'm, yeah exactly I'm, I'm like, <laughs> if you're an expectant dad listening right now ben has got a little tip for you <laughs> just just give it a go just make sure that you're completely comfortable you're gonna obviously you're not gonna get all the wriggling and all of that movement out of a doll but you know at least prepare your mind for what you're about to do <laughs> it sounds like you took to being hands-on like a duck to water. You threw yourself at it, you got stuck in. Um, Was your dad the same with you? Yeah, he was. And, you know, it's only now looking back at it that I've realized potentially how different our setup was at home compared to sort of other family members that I know. Because my dad, he, he's also he's always been self-employed for as long as I can remember. So my early memories of things like school holidays um, or even just the you know general day to day was that my dad would be there. You know, he would take us. I remember very loose memories of going to sort of like nursery and it would be my dad that would pick me up from nursery and drop me off. Um, my sisters, when they were going to like a, a little play group that was sort of preschool again, you know, my dad doing that, picking us up at lunchtime. I guess for me, that was the normal. But it's only as you get sort of older and then you realise that, oh, actually, lots of other dads are kind of working, not even nine to fives, you know, eight till sixes. This is what I was going to ask you next. It's, it's the the experience you had, were you seeing your peers have the same experience? were they as connected? Because it sounds like you were quite connected with your dad and he was there. I mean, doing school pickups, 
I mean, I, I don't think I can remember how many, I could probably count on that one hand or two hands the amount of times my dad did the school pickup. Yeah, it's, I think, as I say, at the time, I didn't realise how different it was. But, you know, as I started to get older, particularly going into secondary school, where, to be fair, by the time I was going to secondary school, I was very sort of independent. I was going to school that was like an hour and a half away from home. So that was very much, you know, me doing bus journeys and and, and whatever myself. Um, but at that point, one of my sisters is 10 years younger than me. So at that point, my dad was kind of almost repeating the cycle again with with that sister um it was actually we we, we were away to get we went on holiday um last month for the first time with with my parents and um we were just sitting down talking about a lot of that and my memories of my youngest sister her, her early days are, are very limited because obviously I was at secondary school and that took up the majority I'd leave the house at 7 15 in the morning and if I was playing football or doing anything after school, I probably wouldn't get home until, you know, half five, six o'clock. So I, there's just this huge chunk of time that I don't really remember. And we were talking about it. And then my dad was saying, oh, yeah, you know, I used to you know, take your little sister to your aunt's house for an hour so I could go and see a client. Then I'd go and pick her up. Then I'd have to go and pick your other sister up from school. It was, you know. Wow. So he was he was he was very, very full on in very hands on in that sense. Um, and yeah, we did have that connection. And as I say, when I probably at the time when I did get to secondary school, that's probably when I realized that certainly the way that other kids used to sort of talk about, you know, their dads and the jobs that they did. I could see that a lot more of them had sort of weekend relationships with their dads. So their dads are very, very busy Monday to Friday. But then it would be like the dad that would take them to football or, you know, take them to the cinema or ice skating or whatever it might have been on the weekends. Can you see how the way your dad was has benefited you? And when you were having that discussion, uh, when you were on holiday, did you start comparing the, the ways that you were both parenting? I mean, I think I could definitely see how it benefited. Um, you know, education was kind of a really important thing for my dad. Um, not necessarily with us going out and getting all the qualifications under the sun, because you know, we've all, me and my sisters, we've all done schooling up until the point, I think, of sixth form. And then none of us have gone off into sort of a higher education or anything like that. So it hasn't been necessarily about going out and getting the qualifications. But it was just very important to him that when we were at school, that we were achieving and that, you know, we were we were doing what was best. And I think that's that's probably my my biggest memory is I used to hate it at the time, but he was very good at getting us to work um <laughs> even school holidays i remember I, someone said to me not so long ago they they said that i had fairly neat handwriting and i was i was really surprised i was thinking i haven't really write that often and i don't think my handwriting is that great but the one memory i do have of handwriting was that even during the school holidays my dad you would get us handwriting to, practice. My dad would get us to sit down and either write out like a story or copy something, okay. you know, just just to kind of kind of keep your mind and your brain active. active. Um, and yeah, handwriting was was just one of those things that we were always sort of like trying to to work on and to improve on. It's just little memories like that that I I still you know really have those. So yeah, they they must have been really important in in terms of shaping me. No, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, but you can, um, you can clarify me on it once, once I sort of let it out. I'm assuming that your dad was pushing you more because you were black. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting conversation because I, I don't remember us sitting down having a specific conversation. I've, I've heard parents that have said things like, because you're black, you're going to have to work twice as hard. You know, all yep. of those sorts of conversations. We've all had those ones. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying we didn't have that conversation. I'm just saying I don't remember it being said to me in in those sort of specific words. Working hard was a given. It, it, it wasn't. I didn't have this thing in me that just thought, oh, because I'm black, it's got to, it's got to be that way. I just thought that everybody had to try and work hard. Um, but I did have that sense that, you know, 
my dad was kind of pushing me just that little bit extra to 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 do things and and to achieve and it's interesting because as i say that wasn't necessarily like i was quite into playing football i didn't play at any you know sort of serious level or anything like that um but there was probably less focus on you know being excellent and being great at football and the the attention was more on the academic, academic side of things, you know, really just getting getting that sorted. And it's an interesting one. As I say, it's it's a I think it's a very it's a very broad conversation yeah. around, you know, academic and whether children that are of colour do need to to be pushed even harder or if they've kind of got to excel in, in certain ways. I think there's definitely, you know, there's probably data out there to show that that probably is the case. And I think I've always thought growing up, you know, my, my children are mixed race. So, you know, it's, there's a, the, even, even within that, there's an element of privilege if you, if you like. Um, and, but I've just thought that I don't want to get it into their heads, certainly at this age that they're going to have to try harder because of the color of their skin. That's that's just my interesting, interesting. Because I've got mixed race kids as well, and I probably have gone the other way. I'm like, no, you 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 need to go for it. You need to put in that little bit extra because sometimes you might not that it might not swing your way. And and this is it's it's in maybe I don't know if it's the ages of of the kids at the moment. True, mine are older than yours. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. My my eldest is only you know as I say he's going to be eight in in the summer. And at the moment, I would say you know given his school, the class, the makeup of it, the diversity that's there, there, it's a pretty level playing field at this stage naturally he is going to he's going to get to a point and the girls are going to get to a point at some stage in their life where decisions are made outside of their control that could be based on on the color of their skin and i I hate that that's even a thing but it would be foolish of me to say it's it's never going to happen and kind of be living in this fairy tale world of you know it's never going to be an issue um but as i say even then you know because it's such a nuanced conversation you know my children may have an element of privilege over a child that was completely black. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's such a, it's crazy. It's It's 2020. It's it's, it's, with 2022 and we're having this conversation and, you know, it's, it's one that needs to be had and, you know, one that I'm very open about talking about, but I mean, it's, it's, it's sad that it's, it's still a thing really, isn't it? We could do a whole, we could do a whole podcast series on that topic, I think without, you know, it's so massive and so huge. But what, I, what I'm taking from what you're saying is that you're very positive about what your children's opportunities will be and the way you will be there to support them to get those opportunities. Is that right? That's definitely right. And, you know, I think a lot of that support comes from just looking at where we are in life at the moment and knowing my thinking around my children growing up so you you have this whole thing of I see a lot of people who say, you know, my kids are never going to, you know, I'm never going to give them anything. They've got to go out, they've got to work hard. They've got to, you know, go and get a job, do all of this. Nothing's going to be handed to them on a plate. And I completely agree. I don't think children should be handed things on a plate because that assumption um, could lead them to being very relaxed and, you know, not excelling and not pushing themselves. Yeah. But I also don't subscribe to this struggle mentality that I think a lot of people have, which is, oh, well, I didn't have it growing up, so you're not gonna gonna have it. I just think sometimes as as parents, if we put ourselves into positions where you know we're doing okay, then why would we not use those situations to help our children? So if my kids come to me and say, Dad, I want to start a business in this particular field, why would I not? avail myself or give them you know contacts or you know not necessarily just going to chuck money at them so that their business can get off the ground but you know sit down and and sort of have those conversations with them and just say look you know this is what's going to be required to actually make this a success I often think about this because I think 
I mean, this could go one of two ways. My kids could turn around to me in a, in a few years time or, you know, sort of towards the end of their schooling and say that they want to go into the world of content creation, for example. Now, years ago, we all know how parents would have reacted if you told them that you were going to... There's still some that would react <laughs> <Yeah>. that way. <laughs> you're going to get, you're going to, you're going to get a camera, you're going to put it in front of yourself and you're just going to talk into the camera and see where it ends up or whatever. Now, yeah. you know, I look at, I look at Arlo at the moment and he's fascinated when we make some of the, when we make some of the videos for Instagram, he's fascinated by the editing process and, you know, he loves transitions and, and things like that. And I'm just going, right. Okay. That's something that I can, you know, help him out with. Um, and if it's not something that I can do personally, you know, there's people I know that could help him. And if he turned around to me and said, look, dad, you know, I want to be a, a video editor or, you know, I want to create my own content then I would be very supportive of that and would try and help him, you know, look at it, break it down, look at it as a business, see what needs to be done. And I just think that that's, that's kind of how it works for me. I, so I, I, when I start thinking about things like people talk about, you know, putting money away for like university and things, that's the furthest thing away from my mind. A, because I didn't have, I didn't go to university myself. Um, but B, I could just see how there could be more, practical benefits that they could have rather than going down that route if they I, I totally get what you're saying because let me give you a little background to what's going on with me so my son's a gymnast he trains for a lot five times a week gymnastics my dad will often ask me so what does Rory want to do when he when he's older and I'm like oh, I think he wants to be a gymnast I'm not forcing him to do it mm. he's He's like fully invested in it. He wants to be a gymnast, but mm, is he going to be able to make money from that? Is what I get from, you know, doesn't he want to be a doctor? Doesn't he want to, you know, he's, he's got, he's got a good brain on his shoulders, all of that. But I am much more of a believer in this day and age that you can make, if, if you enjoy what you you do and you push it to the highest levels, you can be successful and and eventually, if you want to make money, because money isn't the be all and end all of everything, from whatever you are passionate about. Yeah. Right. I mean, back in the day, you wouldn't have said you could make money from being passionate about being a train spotter. No. But in the lockdown, didn't uh, a guy who was spotting trains yeah. become a very, very successful social media um, content producer? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the thing that when we talk about, I suppose, the changes over, you know, let's, let's say the last decade, I guess it is social media has kind of meant that the world essentially is your oyster now. You know, I always say that whatever it is that you're interested in, there's going to be a subset of people that share that same interest. And as you say, depending on how you present it and, you know, would your son be able to financially make the same amount of money as a footballer just from being a gymnast in terms of a salary no but then you know could there be endorsement deals could there be you know could he have his own coaching school one day could that become an academy could that you know exactly and social media and and the way that the world is set up now means that actually those things are very very achievable and I think the, the, the soon it's, it's a generational thing isn't it you know I suppose that's, <laughs> that's 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 the thing it's kind of and we're we're probably just in the middle of that transition period where I think we you are. know we can now see people being very successful from this world but traditionally we wouldn't have necessarily gone down that that route ourselves you know certainly at, at the back from from education yeah definitely uh, it, it's it's an exciting time to be uh, a young person. I think there's so many opportunities, and you can literally have access to so many different things. That I'm excited to see where where the kids of today go, where our kids go, and what they become and what they do. Because I think they'll be very different people to the ones we we are and the ones our parents are. I think what's what's really interesting is the balance that you're gonna we're gonna have to sort of get because. The reality is as well, and I think sometimes people forget this because we live in this world of entrepreneurs and, you know, social media personalities and, and whatever, is that there still has to be a core contingent of people in society that do just go get a nine to five job and work those hours 
come home and, and, you know, their life continues that way. Not everybody has to be an entrepreneur, has to be self-employed. And I, I just think that's, that's kind of, it's maybe what we see a lot of through the media and social media, because that's what people have got in their hands and they're and looking at the majority of the time. But the reality is not everybody is going to going to go down that route. Um, but if if you want to, then yeah, the, the possibilities are there. We are so happy to have Tonka as our sponsor this series. Basic Fun's Tonka collection is packed full of fun vehicles for kids who want to get out and get tough with their toys. So dads, you've got no excuse. Grab that Mighty Steel Classic truck. It's time to head to the sandpit for some tough play. I want to go back now a little bit to um, your kids and their arrivals and some of the things you went through because uh, you started, your first was Arlo uh, you, and we spoke about how, you know, you had to adapt. After that, did you plan to have two, two children, three children, four children, five children? Yeah, so... Um, after Arlo, we we definitely knew that we wanted to have more. I guess once Arlo came along, I suddenly, for me, it was, it was, it was. I don't know if it was an epiphany moment, but it was definitely one of those things that I suddenly realised that okay, maybe this is kind of why we're meant to be here. Um, without Aww. getting, without get, yeah, <laughs> without, without getting too, <laughs> too too deep and spiritual. Um, but you know. It, it was I, I suddenly was like oh okay this is this is what life is 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 about you know you come onto this earth you procreate you have a child and suddenly there's it was just another layer to life for me and it just all clicked and made sense so we certainly knew that we didn't want Arlo to to be an only child um and we're very open to the idea of, of having another and then for us it was just always this conversation of well you know how long do you leave it you know and, and for us the conversation then went down to whilst we've got nappies in the house let's just keep going <laughs> because you know I don't want to get out of don't want to get out <laughs> of the routine to have to get back into it and, and do all of this so Myla you know she she sort of her arrival was 17 months later and we basically then had the same conversation again and which is why there's a then a 17 month gap between her and Esme um because we were 17 just, months 17 months yeah so basically so you had three under three we missed we missed three under three literally by two weeks Arlo turned three in the July Esme was was born on the 14th the third mm. What's the date of birth again? <laughs> mid, mid, mid August. Sophie's going to yeah. kill me. <laughs> Look, I'm going to no, no, I'm going to let you off for that. You got five of them. I struggle with two, mate, and, and then knowing the partner's birthday and then your parents' birthday and all of that. Me. If you throw an extra three people into that, I'm like, oh, let me tap out. Where's the calendar? Yeah. Let me look. At, let me read it on the calendar. <laughs> So yeah, so yeah, just we we I mean essentially the, those two weeks probably didn't really matter much, but yeah, we were we were operating at around that three under three, um, which was which you know what? I remember when we were having Arlo and a friend of a friend sort of said, Oh, you guys are probably gonna have to sort of slow down with your traveling and stuff, because Sophie and I we used to travel quite a bit for work and just for pleasure. It was just that thing that we used to love doing, like you know, the spontaneity of just being like. And a lot of it was around music. You know, we, I remember once having um, Ed Sheeran was playing a gig in Paris um, and we've known Ed for, for some time. And, you know, it was just being able to make those decisions. Wake up one morning, Ed's playing in Paris tonight. Let's go to Paris, you know, and without having to think about it. Um, <laughs> and that was, we kind of continued that. When, when Arlo was born, you know, we, he came on his first flight when he was six weeks and we just, you know, travel was just something that we did if we were on tour in the UK we'd take the kids along with us our whole sort of team of at some point someone will have held a baby backstage or you know gone back to the hotel if they've needed to for, for whatever reason so that kind of just continued and it even when Esme came along we we didn't really slow down with that it was only when Arlo joined preschool and then we started to kind of be more governed by the school holidays that we started to adapt our routine, you know, accordingly. And yeah. that was that was kind of the the biggest change. But we were just, yeah, we, we thought this isn't going to stop what, what we want to do. 
I think that's amazing. That is the way I would, if I was to give people advice, if you can, if you can, and, I, and it's, I, I'm not going to make any um, representations that it was easy for you. No. Um, if, if in any way, shape or form you can try and still do those things, I think it's, it's healthy for your mind as well as your family situation. Definitely. And I felt there was a period of time where our business was, was kind of growing very rapidly. And there was points where clearly it needed, you know, sort of all of our attention, all of our focus, but we were also in the middle of raising a very, very young family. And there's a, a few periods that I look back on and I think, oh, you know, we might have been able to seize that particular opportunity if we'd had a bit more time on our hands or, you know, if we hadn't had to be factoring in, oh, how are we going to get here or how am I going to go there? Or, you know, th there, there are those moments. What I look back on is I look at the music industry and so much of the music industry is about, um, you know, going out, socializing, being out and about with people. And I think my family for me was probably the grounding force in this. Sophie was initially, because I think when I moved from Birmingham to London, I would have quite easily been the type of person that just got caught up in the whole going out, socializing, being around celebrities, taking photos, uploading them to Instagram, but not actually making any money or not actually having anything to show for it other than a, an Instagram grid full of what looked like, you know, happy times. And so because Sophie's the polar opposite to me in that sense of, you know, she likes, she's more calculated or, you know, she likes to think about where she goes. When we got together, it was kind of like, I almost slowed down in that sense as well. And then we started focusing on the business. When the kids came along, it then was like, okay, right. Well, how do we, what's going to make the most financial sense? So suddenly it wasn't about lifestyle anymore. And it wasn't about, you know, just going here and there just to be seen to be there. It was like, is this opportunity going to be worth it? If it's not, we can pass this one on this occasion, you know. And so that was kind of the, I guess, as I say, the grounding force for me, because I suddenly just didn't go off and do what, sadly, I've seen lots and lots of people do. It's, it's really interesting how, as a parent, your priorities change and you look at things differently and you look at the future differently mm -hmm. as well. Definitely. Speaking of the future, you got to the point there where you uh, had three children, mm -hmm. almost three under three. Then your next pregnancy wasn't as straightforward, right? No, it wasn't. So again, we got to that situation where around the 10 month mark, <laughs> something magical about the 10 months, something happens at 10 months. <laughs> 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 Some, something, magical something very magical happens around the 10 month mark where, how old's your youngest now so our youngest is four months oh we've got six months to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um so yeah so esme was around 10 months and sophie fell pregnant again and this was our twin pregnancy um so we would have basically we would have had that same scenario where 17, 18 months, give or take, there, there would have been another, not one, but two children um, come into the world. So yeah, Sophie falls pregnant. We find out that it's twins, which was obviously a massive shock to us. And that adjustment was, it, it took a lot to adjust to that initially. I mean, once you find out, you know, there's, there's literally nothing you can do about it. So my mentality with all of these things is just, we're going to have to make it work. You know, it's, we're, we're going to have five children, um, including a, a set of twins. And, you know, the, the, the pregnancy in the early stages was, was fine. Um, you know, naturally when you're, you're pregnant with twins, I think you have a few more checks anyway. Um, we also wanted to do that for our own peace of mind. So we weren't, we were very sorry, sorry, we were very used to going and getting sort of additional scans and you know the checks and, and things like that. We actually kept it a secret that we were having twins up until 16 weeks. 
um, basically we wanted to reveal it to everyone at a gender reveal that we did. Um, so we kind of announced that we were pregnant uh, around the, the sort of 10, 12 week mark, something like that. But we didn't actually tell family and friends and the world on Instagram at that point that we were pregnant with uh, with the twins until till that reveal. And obviously everyone's like massively happy for you. And then, yeah, we went away. Um, it was the sort of three years ago, the, the, the Easter holidays equivalent of what we've just had. We went away. Sophie came back. We had what would have been her 20 week scan at around the 21 week mark. Absolutely fine. Literally had the scan in the morning. Everything's looking good. Um, yeah. A follow up check with her doctor in, in the afternoon. And then by the evening on that same day, Sophie just said that she was in like the most excruciating pain. And, you know, it's very unusual for her. I think she's got a very yeah. like, high pain threshold. So it was concerning, but not, you know, at the point that she said it, it was kind of one of those go and have a lie down or, you know, go and have a bath, that sort of thing. It, you know, yeah. it will pass. I suppose with a multiple pregnancy, you start just thinking, you know, is this just the, like she was saying, is this just the weight of having two children now? Yeah. You know, is, is that why it feels so different? But I do remember a distinct turning point where she messaged me and just said, this isn't good. And she said, I think she said, I hope I'm not in labor. And when she said that, I was like, okay, she wouldn't use the term labor just for any sort of pain. And yeah. so, you know, we were obviously on the phone to the doctor who, who she'd seen earlier in the day. And he was just like, you know, did you have a fall? Did you, is there, has there been some sort of trauma that's been associated with this that would yeah. bring on labor? And she was just like, no, nothing's changed. Um, long story short, she she was she was going into she was going into early labor um we had to get the, the the medical we had to get the medics out that evening uh they came to the house i sort of took one look at their faces as they were sort of doing the checks and they, they don't really do much they, they want to get you to a hospital but i could just tell by their faces that something wasn't right so we go to the hospital and yeah sophie's there contractions they're prepping us telling us that we're essentially going to give birth that evening um, because it was so early, 21 weeks. You know, they talk about this viability period of, of 24 weeks. We were so way off that, but they were just saying, you know, the focus once babies come, there's not going to be anything we can do. Our attention is going to be on Sophie because we want to make sure that she's, you know, doesn't go into septic shock or anything like that, which was, which they were saying was very common. And so we were just, I mean, we were, we were just in absolute shock because nothing can prepare you for that. You, you know that people have this happen in their pregnancies. I didn't know anyone specifically that had gone through it in, in the same way that we were now experiencing. We knew a lot of early miscarriages or, you know, missed miscarriages, all of those sorts of things, but not at this stage where you think that everything's okay and there's no reason why anything should go wrong. So I just remember being in the hospital that evening and just, yeah, shock is the only word that I can use for it, really. Um, you know, I remember calling my mum and dad and sort of like breaking down on the phone crying because I just, deep down, I was like, we're not going to get to 24 weeks. And it's, it's strange because 24 weeks at the time seemed like this holy grail of let's get to 24 weeks because yeah, then maybe <clears throat> then we'll be all right. We'll be okay. But the reality is, even if we got to 24 weeks, you still got another struggle. That's a we've we've we spent some a very, very we spent a couple of days in a in a NICU ward with with Zaya back in January. And I've seen a 25 week baby on, you know, on the on the ward. And I know how long a struggle and an uphill struggle that family have got on their hands now, you know, in terms of, you know, when that child will eventually come home etc so but at the time you you know you'll grasp you want something you want some sort of hope that it's going to be okay and you know you start googling and I'm looking and you know you find google anything you're going to be able to find a, a a good example of something so I remember finding an example of a family that did have a baby at 24 weeks and then I think there was one in America where there was like multiples that were born and you know they're okay now and was just hanging on to that that hope 
And basically the that evening, Sophie's contractions just stopped. There's, there's no reason the medical team were baffled by it. We were baffled by it. And because everybody, you know, that they had literally, they, they brought in the delivery equipment into the room that, that she was in. And then they wheeled it out because they were like, you're, you're no longer in active labor. Um, but they kept saying to her, just let us know if anything changes with your body. And we then, I, I sort of, at that point, kind of made the decision because we, you know, the diary of a dad was already a thing at this point. And, you know, we've been up and running for, for a little while. And, you know, we document everything within reason. But for me, it was one of those moments that I thought, I want people to know what we're going through. Um, you know, I didn't want to just disappear and then come back with some bad news. I didn't want to disappear for a short while and then come back and just be like, oh, actually, you know, this has been going. I, I wanted to sort of That's huge. Explain, explain it in real time. And, you know, obviously Sophie and I had spoken about that. What are we prepared to share and what are we not? you know, what do we not want to share? And the love and support that came from the Instagram community was just insane. Like for all the negative things that can be said about social media, I think I saw social media at its very best, you know, just the, just even people just messaging to say, you know, we're thinking of you was, was, was huge versus then, you know, other people who, um, had been through it themselves um, you know there were people that were going through it in hospital there's one lady that was messaging me she's like I'm in hospital at the moment literally going through what your wife is and you know I don't know what to do and you know all of these sorts of things um, so there was this real sense of community basically we were in hospital for eight days before anything else happened um, every day being monitored our son's waters had, uh, it was our son's waters that had gone on that first night or started to, to, to diminish on the first night. So the sack had, had ruptured and, and was slowly going, um, but he was still fine. You know, every day that we had a scan, there was still two heartbeats. And then, yeah, day eight, Sophie just went into labor. There was, again, no particular reason for it, no real trigger behind it. But it was at that point that they just said, you do realize this is now where it's going to happen. And because we were just like 22 weeks at this point, again, we were still back in that situation. And they came early and, you know, sadly, um, you know, obviously didn't make it. And so sorry, dude. Yeah, it's that that whole period. It's a bit of a blur in some respects because there's. I think sometimes, I don't know if this is a, well, I do know that it's a thing. I think sometimes when you go through like a traumatic experience, your brain does this weird thing where it like, maybe it just puts it to the back of your memory. So even when I, when I tell the stories, I remember I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times on various other podcasts and, you know, like my dates are a little bit off or, you know, the, the way in which it happened isn't quite right. And Sophie would be like, oh, I thought it was this day. And I was like, you just probably remember it very differently to, to how I do. Um, but yeah, it was, it was horrible. It was, I never thought that I would have to go through that experience. Um, because three back to back, barely normal pregnancies and, and healthy children. And then just this shock. And I remember, us. I just remember thinking afterwards, or I remember thinking even whilst all of this was going on that, you know, I was just like, we, we have to stop now. I was thinking I can't go and have any more children after this because yeah. like, how could you, I, I just, okay. couldn't, just couldn't imagine another pregnancy having gone through that. Um, I just, I thought what, what, what I thought actually kind of became reality because when we did then later become pregnant, uh, fall pregnant with, with Otis, that struggling to make a connection with this child was was quite difficult for me. I think for the mum, that's it, there's different feelings there that you have because obviously the mum is physically growing the child, so she's got that that daily reminder, and you know maybe even intensifies that that feeling. You know this, the feeling of being scared or worried or, or whatever because she's got it there. Whereas for me, it was just 
I just didn't want to get my hopes up. And that was, you know, just not knowing. And then suddenly because of, because we were having a fairly normal pregnancy with the twins and there was nothing to suggest that there was any issues, suddenly all of the scans and the checks and all of those weekly milestones didn't mean anything to me because I was like, well, you know, we had that with the twins. We, you know, we did the harmony test. There was nothing wrong with that. We got to 12 weeks. We were fine. We got to 16 weeks. We were fine. We got to 20 weeks. They were, they were fine the morning of the 20 weeks. ago. So for me, all of those weekly milestones, yeah, as I say, they, they just didn't really matter. I did want to get to 24 weeks again. That was kind of that one that you yeah. start thinking, okay. But then it was like 30 weeks. You know, you look up what could happen at 30 weeks. You know, what's the the, the survival rate at that point? And so I, I just felt that throughout that pregnancy, I was kind of watching the the calendar almost, which when we talked at the outset about lockdown and, you know, the, that slowing down and just knowing that Sophie was able to take it easy. We needed that. We needed it a hundred percent. You know, we needed for her not to be going, not to be going and doing the school run with the other kids and, you know, yeah. it was all home learning and stuff like that. So, you know, it just, that, that really, really helped. And then, the latter stages of the pregnancy were fine. Um, Sophie had had a cervical stitch that had been put in because we realized that that was probably what had happened with um, the, the the twin pregnancy, that it was an incompetent cervix. And so as a precaution early on in Otis's pregnancy, they, they put in a cervical stitch and, you know, that you reach a, I think it's like 36 weeks where they take it out. And, you know, that was the point where you start to breathe a bit of a sigh of relief, you know, you're in the final stretch, but even then, do you know what became really heightened to me was all the stories that I'd hear of, you know, people going into hospital ready to give birth to their children and not coming away with a baby, you know, stillborns yeah. at like 39, 40 weeks and, and all of these things. And I just think that whoever you are, I don't care how strong you are. Once you've gone through that sort of loss, those things are just always going to be there in your head. Did, did you, did you grieve? Have you grieved? Because I only asked those two questions and I'll give you a background to why we've had a couple of people on the, on the podcast who have talked about loss in different um, ways. Uh, and we had another dad who actually lost twins. Right. And he didn't grieve for 14 years. Yeah. He, he, he shut that away didn't really deal with it until the maybe the i think it was the 14th anniversary of his twins passing and he was made to uh his wife had had, had a ritual of delivering um birthday cakes to mm -hmm. people who supported and things like that it's a really really touching story but at this 14th anniversary um, she was having cancer treatment at the right. time. So she made her husband go and do the deliveries and stuff. And it was the first point that he looked into their memory boxes and right. then he broke down. And that was when he re realised that he hadn't actually been dealing with it at all. And there are other stories that I've talked on Dad Vengers Dad Chats and, and podcasts and whatever and just in group meetups and whatnot of men not properly dealing with grief yeah. um, when it happens which which is totally understandable but it, it it it's a thing yeah and i think it's a great question did i grieve at the time yes to in the sense that when it happened you know you acknowledge what's going on in that moment and that time and you know, we wanted to be very, we were very private about that element of, of things. Um, even down to when we, obviously we, we had to say, obviously there are, there are lots of options around, you know, how you choose to, to, to remember a child when, when that happens. Um, we went for sort of a more formal burial. Um, and, but we chose to do that completely privately, just myself, Sophie, and, and one other close friend. And, that was because 
from a grieving perspective, I remember Sophie saying to me that if we have friends and family that come along to this service, knowing the character that she is, she would have just tried to put on like a really brave face for them that day and wouldn't have been able to, to grieve properly. And she didn't want to do that. She wanted to be able to let go of her emotions and, and do that. And so whilst it initially, I wasn't, I wasn't really sure because I, I think, you know, there was lots of other people that I'm sure would have loved to have, have been there with us just to, you know, support us. I know that now that was definitely the right decision for us um, because we could just grieve in our, in our own, in our own way. I think I, you said, are you grieving? Or you said, have you grieved? Did you grieve? And are you grieving? I think the long term side of things, I look back at the twins with a very, in a strange way, quite fond memories. We, you know, do I think about what it would be like, what they would be like if they were here today? Obviously, you know, we've, we've just, it's just been almost, um, well, it's just been three years since their passing um, last month. And yeah, you, at those points, you think about it, you're like, oh, you know, what would they have been like? What would it have been like having twins? All of, all of those sorts of things. But then we had three other young children at the time that straight away needed our attention and our focus. So whereas people who go through this for the first time maybe have that extra time to kind of you know, dwell on it, to think about it, allow it to maybe shape their decisions for the, the future. I just didn't feel like we really took that time away because once Sophie was out of hospital, she was just like, I just want to get back to my kids. You know, I just want to be with my babies. And the show goes on in, in terms of, you know, just, just doing that. And so sometimes I do think, have I had that moment that it sounds like, you know, your, your other father that you mentioned there just had that real moment of like, wow, this has really hit me now. And it's, yeah. it's effective. Yeah. And, 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 but then with grief, that that's the other thing is everyone grieves differently. So there doesn't have to be that one no. big moment. So it, it may never necessarily come for me. Maybe it was, you know, at, at the kid's funeral, but for instance, when I go, when we go to the, the cemetery, um I don't cry hmm. and at first I, I think I used to think is that like really weird like should every time I come here should there be like tears flowing from my eyes and you know but actually that's just kind of my way of dealing with it it's, as I say I think of it as more of a a fond memory in that that was a moment in our lives they were a part of our lives they're always going to be but it's not an overarching grief that I feel day to day. Yeah. That makes sense. I think I think it's totally normal to not be in in floods of tears every time you go to the funeral. To the, sorry, to the cemetery. Because if if I think about it, say I was visiting my nan's grave or or something along those lines. Sometimes you'd want to go and just remember the good things or remember, you know, or think about things in a different way. You don't always have to to be thinking about the sad things and, and the horrible things. Sometimes you can think about the things that are positive, like you do, because you, you seem like a very positive person. Yeah, I try to be. And I think what stands out to me, and this is, again, maybe just my character, Sophie's character, in that we grieve the same way. When we were at the cemetery in last month, we, we sort of had our time and, you know, um, just by the, by the gravestone, the, the headstone, and what was really standing out to us was just that when our kids were buried in that, in that part of the, the cemetery, they were one of the first in that particular area. And when we looked around, we were like three years on and this whole sort of butterfly garden, they call it is basically now full. So we then start talking about all the other families that have gone through, you know, you can't help but notice some of the headstones and the dates and you just think, oh, that's a, you know, that was either a similar situation to what we went through or maybe a child that lived for a year or maybe up to three yeah. or four years. So my head then goes to, I then start thinking about other people and, you know, these are complete strangers, people I don't even know, but I'm thinking, oh, I hope that they're okay. And, you know, I, 
I hope that they've been able to kind of get through this in whatever way, you know, you can get through this for us. It was having the other kids was the focus. Sophie very early on saying to me that, you know, I feel as though we, we had a lot more love to give. So that was the, the conversation of then, would we have more children? We were never against it. And that's kind of, you know, we, we obviously had Otis and, you know, have now subsequently had Zaya because I feel, I feel like we, we always had that. And it was never a case of, oh, we've got to get to five children to kind of make that number. It wasn't, it wasn't that because even at this stage, if you'd asked, <laughs> if you'd asked me a few months ago, if we were done, it was a resounding yes. Like it, it, there was no question. Uh-oh. Even the Uh-oh. way, <laughs> even the Waiting way for the ten month bitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> even, the, even the way that Sophie was talking at the time was just like, I've never said this, but you know, I think I'm done. And now we're we're four months in with with Zaire, and you know, I'm not saying we're going to have another one, but I'm also saying. You, you know, haven't ruled it out. We haven't we haven't ruled it out. So that's how I know it wasn't just a it wasn't a case of let's get to this magic number of five. There's a lot to go into that has to go into thinking about having a, a, a sixth child because or any more children than that, because logistically. I think you, I might have to open a book on this because this sounds like it might be an, a, a <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> might, I might have to open a book on whether the diary of the dad's gonna go for six. <laughs> <laughs> it's um you know i think it's that there would be a lot to and there's a lot to you know if i look back at the last if i look back at certainly the last eight years and there's a there's a there's kind of a little bit of stuff before we even s- sort of started having a family so if i look back across the the last decade kids pregnancies all of this sort of stuff has basically been our life for for, for that period of time I, I just think I look at Sophie and I just think just even from what her body has gone through over the last decade, yeah. you know, eight years specifically, you know, more specifically, I just think she deserves a rest, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, and she, and she loves being pregnant. That's the thing she, you know, she actually really enjoys pregnancy. I think pregnancy suits her very well. She, you know, she, she does, she just comes into her own in, in that space, but you know, there's a point where we have to start thinking about, you know, maybe a little bit selfishly our lives. And, you know, we we are more than mum and dad. You know, there is Ben and Sophie that, that sit behind all of this. And as the kids get older, that's going to afford us the opportunities to be able to kind of, you know, regain some of, of that. And so I think I, th- I think that's important. Um, but, you know, at, at this stage, we have to just be very grateful and blessed for the fact that, we have five happy, healthy children um, who all appear to be thriving in their, their own different ways. That's lovely. There's a couple of bits that I want to cover before we finish up. Um, one, you spoke about the outpouring of, of kindness and people during your tough time. Being as this is a, a sort of a podcast that likes to, to focus and highlight on the dad side of things, Instagram, social media is populated less by men than women. Did, did men reach out to you who'd experienced the same thing or, or were going through it because we don't, often we don't? Yeah, there, there was. There, obviously way less than, than the mothers. I mean, yeah, yeah, of course. My, my following is 92% female. Um, so... You know, I think um, the figures were always going to be skewed in that sense. So there was dads that had gone through it that, that did reach out and they were very, very supportive. Um, speaking to some of these dads and now knowing their stories, I can understand why some of them were actually, I felt at the time, very persistent in terms of, you know, checking in on me and making sure that we were, I was OK. When you hear their stories and, you you know, you find out what they've been through, you know, some of these people have had very, very dark times. And so they just wanted to make sure that someone that they knew wasn't going through the same thing. So that was a, a, a real source of support. And then since it's happened, and I think this probably was the positive of me sharing it and speaking about it. I didn't want to be defined by it on, on social media. So I, I never wanted my account to become a, 
we only talk about losses. Yeah. Um, you know, there are accounts out there that do that and do it incredibly well. And I, I, you know, I really take my hat off to them talking about it on a regular basis in a way that, you know, is, is a source of support for others. But for me, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Um, but lots of people are, are aware that we've been through this. So I very often, sadly, will get a dad DM me out of the blue, you know, doesn't really, doesn't really know me, doesn't, some don't even necessarily follow me, but maybe their partners told them of, you know, this, or they've heard me talk on a podcast or, or something. And, you know, just ask, you know, how do you get over this? You know, what am I supposed to do? Um, and I'm by no means an expert. I'm just one of sadly many that have been through that situation. So there are little bits of advice that I give largely around communication um i just think that that's so so important i feel as though i got very immersed in the world of social media around the time that this was all happening you know i've got this account that was taking off just before you know that we even fell pregnant with the twins you go through this you know you see that other huge spike you know other people that have been through it and it became so much easier for me to talk to people online behind screens yeah. than sometimes it was to even have a conversation with Sophie. And wow. yeah. I just feel that was kind Almost of- Almost like therapy. Yeah, like therapy, also distractions. You know, yeah. I didn't not necessarily, you know, I'm not gonna say every conversation I was having with people was, was, about, was about losses. You know, you, you talk about the mundane things in life, you know, you have fun, yeah. you joke, you laugh, you do all of these things. As a, as a form of distraction. Um, and I think coming to that realization and, and just recognizing that was useful because while Sophie is on social media, she certainly doesn't take it as seriously as I do. And, you know, isn't as, it's, it's not as massive a part of her life as it is mine. And so I had to recognize that. And, you know, this is where when you talk about grieving, I think, you know, that happens across different stages. And so we had to kind of do that together across various stages. So just because she seemed to be fine, I needed to be able to offer that support because it may not necessarily have always been the case. And I wasn't okay for a lot of that time. I was kind of just trying to just get on with things and, you know, as I say, find those, those distractions. So in answer to your question, yes, there, there are dads, that do reach out that did reach out and i just i just hate that there's i just hate that so many people actually experience losses it's i think we're getting better at talking about it but yeah it still is a bit of a taboo essentially a taboo subject you know no one yeah. really like none of us like talking about it yeah and I, I think it's really important when you just said that you weren't okay because people may see you now and say you've dealt with it really well and that you're able to talk about it and all those things. So hearing that you weren't okay, it will be inspiring for and someone you know, out there do, listening. Go on. Do you know, one of the points, there's a, there's a particular time period. I remember this, it was the summer after it had, had happened and we go, we go over to, and this is, this is a, I want to mention this because I think this is a classic example of social media. We went to Ibiza um, with our, our musicalized team and um, we were over there for a festival and arguably one of the best few days I've ever had in, in Ibiza. Um, Stormzy had this, it was called Murky Fest and it, it just like had everybody there. All of his like favorite artists were performing. It was Ibiza Rocks Hotel. Um, you know, all the footballers were had broken up for the season. They were all out there. We were just having the, the best, best time. And one day, one of the days, the, the party sort of goes on quite late into the night. And I remember Sophie had gone back to the hotel to, to look after the kids. And I'd carried on, stayed out partying. And if you'd been following me on social media that day, you know, you'd have seen my stories, you'd have seen the VIP balcony, the, the champagne. He's having a the, ball. The, yeah, I'm having the best time. And that evening, I end up, at the end of the evening, when everyone's kind of leaving, I end up having this conversation with um, a guy that I've known in the music industry for some time. And 
he sits me down and he's just like, you know, I just wanted to say that, you know, I love watching what you guys have done over the last, you know, however many years. It's really inspiring. And I broke down and started crying. And there's, it's weird because there, there was alcohol involved. I know that I, that day I probably had like way more to drink than I would normally and, and, and whatever. So, but I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't falling all over the place drunk or anything. And yeah. so, but I look back at it and the conversation, I mean, it must've come as a shock to him anyway, because like, why am I getting so emotional about him just talking yeah. about the business? But I believe that within me, there was still that thing where I just hadn't really let go. So yeah. when someone came along and was commending me and telling me about how inspiring they felt I was from a business sense, I just had that little bit in me that just needed to get it out. And yeah. that was kind of the, the, the avenue that, that was, was chosen. It's really weird because I've not, I spoke to him a little bit the next day. I was just like, I'm really sorry about that. That must have come as a bit of a shock. <laughs> no, you don't need to be sorry. Carry on, <laughs> um, carry on. But I couldn't, I haven't really like brought myself to have like, how much did I, like what exactly was I saying? You know, I don't remember every single bit of the conversation. And I don't know if he does as well, because as I say, we, we had been out partying and, uh, and whatever. But it just, as I say, for, for me, social media, if you'd seen me on that day, you would have said that I was, probably at my my happiest in my most comfortable surrounding which I was on the face of it but yeah. I was clearly going going through something some stuff and that's just always a constant reminder for me you know a, wow. a definite reminder that everything you see on socials you know may not be as glamorous and as we think it may it makes me think of of that moment that you, 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 we were talking before about that grieving moment when it hits you. Mm. Maybe that maybe, was yours. Maybe, maybe that, was, that was yours right yeah. there. And it wasn't anything, as I say, because it wasn't a specific conversation about yeah. the twins. Maybe that's why I've always kind of dismissed it. But actually now having this conversation, <laughs> that, you know, that maybe was just that moment that, that, that it needed, it needed to happen. And yeah. again, that's why, as I say, it's very difficult to kind of give it any advice on this, this topic. I can only speak about my lived experience with it. See, the thing is, sometimes it's not even about advice. It's about hearing other people's stories and how they've dealt with their stories, just so that it gives you the confidence to say, OK, this is my story and I've got to I've got to go through it and I've got to deal with it, just like Ben went through, mm. through it. And I've got to find my my place and my my peace yeah somewhere and and i think it's really important so thank you very much for being so open and, and telling us about that story now on social media we were talking about social media i i put it to the people to send some questions in for you so i've got a couple for you here um first up is from donald our mutual friend donald, okay <laughs> <laughs> who says and we haven't touched upon any of this so you might have to to give it a little bit of a the caveat mm -hmm. how do you deal with the negativity that you some may sometimes get on social uh, because you always still have a smile on your face and it's inspirational yeah because there, there there are lows that come with the the highs of social media there are the lows of yeah i mean you know the way i look at my social media is my social media is it's all relative isn't it in my head my social media following is relatively small to other people, it may seem like huge. Um, and that that's just, that's a, that's a numbers thing. The, the negativity that seems to come, I usually find is more based on lifestyle and the things that we do and the experiences that we're able to have. So. So jealousy if, of the fact that you can go to Ibiza Rocks and party with Stormzy brings out some, well, some you know, brings out some haters it's a, as, a, <laughs> as an example i have that using that particular day i happen to be on a on a balcony a vip balcony that i've paid for you know there's you know there's no handouts have, have been given here and yeah. happen to be standing next to raheem sterling Jaden sancho and, and a few others and i remember putting up a video and then which was just a general like round the route around the venue story and you know you could see them in the background and 
whilst most people who saw that were like, oh, it's amazing. I would love to be there. Yeah, yeah. There was that one person who was like, look at him trying to show off because he's with the footballers. Look at him, who does he think he is? Blah, 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 blah. And, and it's the joke is that's the one out of all the nice things that were said, it was the one comment that stuck in my head and that I remembered because, and then you start trying to, there's, there's points where I just look at it and laugh and go, you, you're just hilarious. And then there's the other points where the, the energy that you then start to give is more towards the negativity. I've got yeah. so much better at it recently. The thing I can't stand is, the thing I can't stand is trolls. Um, if you want to question me about any of my choices in relation to what I post on social media, completely open for any conversation. You want to message yeah. me in the DMs, that's fine. Go off to another website and start talking about me and my family and you know making these wild assumptions that's where I kind of draw the line because at the end of the day I'm a person I have feelings my family you know Sophie has feelings and but as I say at the moment or, or, or over the last couple of years it all just seems to go back to those lifestyle things you know oh why are they always on holiday um you know they don't, people don't realize that sometimes when we go to Dubai, we're actually working, working because yeah, I don't, exactly. docu- because I don't document every minute of yeah. every single day. It's like, Oh, why are they always on holiday? Um, you know, then it will be the amount of nannies that we have, you know, just cause we have like a rotor and like nannies that work on rotation rather than just having one sort of fixed person. And, you know, then, it, but then it's, it's the assumptions that I really hate the most because Sophie and I have worked incredibly hard for well over a decade now in our business and yeah. any assumptions that get cast that, you know, we've something I saw not so long ago was that we get by on sort of like family money because they were like, basically someone couldn't work out how we could have had two, nearly two years of non-activity in the business and still be able to afford to go on holiday. But what they don't realize is that, I'm not going to say we planned for rainy days. We, we didn't, pl- no one planned for two years of non-activity in their, in their business, but we have made smart business decisions behind the scenes, things that I don't talk about and that we don't go into in, in massive detail. Um, you know, Instagram in itself, look what I've been able to do with Instagram at a period of time when I couldn't work and do events. That's when my Instagram came into its own. And I don't shy away from the fact that that in itself is its own business now. So actually I apply myself and we work really hard. So I hate when someone then tries to discredit that. Why is it easier to claim that we've either got family money or one ludicrous thing that we saw once was that we've won that, that we're secret lottery winners. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Wicked. All right, ben. Cool, man. Um, <laughs> I, I can, I can assure you if there had been any lottery money, you would not be seeing, you would not be seeing any you of us. Not- exactly you'd be chilling <laughs> we would be on be our own private chilling. island somewhere else and you know well away from it from everything but you know so I think there's there's that and I get that social media is that forum that everybody has and you know people are choosing to follow I my overarching thing with social media sorry to labor on on this question now go on it's just that if you don't like something on social media, just unfollow the person, block them, mute them, use whatever you need to do, do that. to get they it out of your consciousness. That. They love to hate. Haters love to hate. And, th- and this is the thing. <laughs> that's, that's why I've become, in answer to Donald's question, I've now, I'm now at peace with the fact that not everybody that follows me likes me and that some people are watching with a critical or a hateful eye or, or whatever the case may be. And that's a them problem rather than it being mine. So as long as, as long as we don't cross that line where, you know, things get said that are either categorically untrue or, you know, outright lies about us, I'm okay with it, you know. Um, but by all means, as I say, if someone wants to, to ask a question or, you know, wants to say, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm not too sure that, you know, what you posted there is, is the most appropriate or whatever, that that's a that's a that's a conversation that can be had nice dude nice i like it we've got one here from mark uh what's the most important life lesson you hope to pass on to your kids to be nice to people 
Um, doesn't cost anything, does it? No, it doesn't cost anything. And being nice to people without there being a reason to be nice to people, I think is just so, so valuable. Um, we just had, a, we, we celebrated two nights ago with a, a very good friend of ours who lots of people will know, uh, Mo Gilligan won a BAFTA. Dude, I saw this party, right? I was like, where is my invite? I was on Insta and I was like, hold on. There's a lot of black faces in this party. And I must, my invite must have got lost in the post or something. It was, the only thing I can say is it was a small venue. So it was, it was a very intimate thing. And with, with Mo, the reason I mentioned that, again, someone will be there going, why is he mentioning that he was at Mo Gilligan's after party? But the reason that I'm mentioning it is because I believe that Sophie and I were, were invited because over a period of what is now we worked out 11 plus years, we have been nice to Mo and Mo has been nice to us. And there was a point where there's, you know, we used to see Mo when he was literally like opening as a, an opening comedian for, for a live music event that used to happen in London. And, you know, we've watched the growth and we followed it and we champion him and we shout him and we sing his praises. And, you know, we're just genuinely so, so proud of that, of that guy. And there has never been a condition with that friendship or, you know, with, with being nice to, to him or, you know, anything like that. So then when he personally messaged me to, to invite us to that and gave his reasons as to why, you know, he wanted to extend that invitation to us. That that meant a meant a lot to me, but I just thought, actually, do you know what? Uh, that was a really nice thing to do, and I just think th there's, there's been countless of countless people that you know have kind of been involved in in some shape or form who may not even remember me, um, and we don't do this stuff to be remembered. But that was just to me, it was just a, one of those things where I thought, just be nice, like you said, it doesn't cost anything, and when you do it with no expectations, anything that you get back is just a beautiful bonus. So there's one thing I need to do before we let you go, Ben. We ask all of our Dad Vengers guests this, and it's this question. If you could have a dad superpower, what would it be and why? I think my dad's superpower would be to slow down time. <laughs> <laughs> that would be or the, wow. or, yeah or just <laughs> actually maybe do you remember that oh this this is bad there's going to be this whole generation who might go on who have no idea do you remember the tv program bernard's watch yes do you know what i do remember that that program he so had a watch. he had a watch on, explain it he had a watch I, I don't remember the specific but it was like a little handheld little watch like that old school style and he could pause time basically and he could yeah. go off and, and, and do things and, and, and whatever and, and the world. That would be the one I would choose because I always say, but it genuinely feels like there are not enough hours in the day. So there are points, largely when my kids are all kicking off, that I would love to just press pause, go off and do what <laughs> I need to do, get myself in the right headspace and then come back and press start and then just address the, the, the matter there and then. That, that would be Dude, what I would choose. That is a great <laughs> superpower. Yeah, definitely. When you find that watch, shout me. I'll buy one as well. And you know, Arlo even said to me the other day that he wishes that, that, would, that he had the superpower to be able to go back in time because we were talking about something the other day and I was saying to him, I said to you this. And he was like, you didn't say that, dad. You didn't say that. And I was like, I did. He and he's like, if I could go, he goes, this is why I want that superpower because I know you didn't say it to me. <laughs> That, that, do you know what it would it would it would fix a lot of arguments and disputes i reckon being able to go back in time and say look you did say that or you didn't say that exactly that's the parent in life right there i told you to come away from the tv no you didn't i did you were so engrossed you didn't hear me you said it to one of the other million children in the house dad <laughs> Ben, thank you so much for being here mate um like you said there's not enough hours in the day so the fact that you took some hours to, to come and chat is really, really great. And I'm thankful for it. And I think um, hopefully that people listening will benefit from some of the things that you've talked about and some of the things you've explained. No, and honestly, thank you, Nigel, for having me. And I love everything that you're doing with, with Dad Vengers, with the podcast, with the live chats on Instagram and, you know, all the other stuff that, that goes on. And 
I think, as we've said, there's so much opportunity in this space with dads and the more dads that get involved, the better. Um, yeah, definitely. And also just, I, and I, but what I also love as well is, you know, conversations like what we've just had, it's, it's not dad specific. So, you know, parents, mums, dads, whatever, oh, definitely. grandparents can, can listen to this stuff. And we're just talking about very real things. And yeah, I think, you know, fair play to you for, for what you're doing in this space. And I, I, I look forward to, to following your journey and seeing how that continues to grow as well. Dude, we need to collaborate. And anytime you're looking for a guest on the old podcast, because you've got an amazing podcast that you started this year that's growing. Um, we, def- we definitely need to, you need to, we need to, uh, to flip. The, reverse flip, the chat. Flip the ta- yeah, reverse the chat. And um, yeah, I will, I will get you on for sure. Defo, mate. You have a lovely day and I'll speak to you soon. Take care. Ben Anderson, The Diary of a Dad. Spoke so well, spoke so openly. Um, even discovered things during our conversation about himself, which just shows you that he's a dad who's open to new ways of thinking, open to looking at himself. Uh, and yeah, I think we can all learn from that. So there you go, another episode done. But what did you think of it? We would love to know. Leave us a review or a comment on Apple Podcasts or on social media about this episode or the series as a whole. And don't forget, if you want to be first to hear brand new episodes, make sure you subscribe by your preferred podcast platform. To find out more about Dad Vengers, make sure you head to our website, dadvengers.com, where there is information about our live chats, our dad walks, our blog posts, and more. We'll see you soon.